Give it up for my guy, Mr. Matt Elliott. Hello. Thanks for coming out. I uh, given a talk today, the modular structure of blockchains. So uh, thank you, Portia, for introduction. But uh, a little bit more. I live in Birmingham. So woo, Alabama. Well, I grew up in Mississippi. Hell State. In Hell State. Hell State. So uh, got my computer science degree. Uh, went back, got my MBA from UAB. The computer science and the math, or the computer science and the finance came together. Blockchain, like same time. So around 2011, got involved a little bit uh, from uh, that guy just talking about it a little bit too much. Yeah, that's me. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about it today. So just quickly about Babel Street. We sponsored it. This is our second year here. We have a table out back, have uh, quite a few guys here. We uh, do not work in Web3. Web3 is just a hobby for me. So Babel Street is a uh, AI-driven data analytics open source intelligence company. And we're in the security space, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so stop by our booth if you haven't talked with us yet. We're happy to be here for the second year. So to talk into the presentation, we're gonna talk what is a blockchain, what functions compose a blockchain, and then we're gonna break down those functions and put them back together, kind of a way to build them up as the layer twos. So before we begin, do you need to know this? Short answer, no. This is a developer conference though, and I know Web3 crypto has a ton of hype on it, a lot of blockchain stuff. What is a blockchain? Let's talk about what that means. You don't need to know this information in order to use a blockchain. So if you want to go out and buy some tokens, use some dApps, change some coins, mint some NFTs. Oh, do we have any render NFTs yet? Anybody? No? All right, let's, we're going to get some? We got them? I haven't got one. Let's get them. Anyway, uh, you don't need to know this. So you can use it without knowing this, but this is a developer conference. So let's talk about it from a developer's point of view. So what is a blockchain? A blockchain is just a database. Fancy database, that's it. It's just a database, it stores data. It's a shared database. This database is distributed to hundreds or thousands of computers. All the databases are the same. They all share the same data. You can run your own copy of this database and get your own copy of this database. But it's shared. It's a consistent, shared programmable database. Consistent meaning that it has a mechanism for staying in sync between these hundreds and thousands of computers. It's a database. That's the end of the story. As in every other database we have today, there's APIs for it. These APIs are in the same thing with blockchains. They're, they're transactions you create, they go onto the chain and they make uh, state changes. So, again, at the end of the day, anytime you think of anybody says blockchain, just think database. If you can't do it in a normal database, you can't do it on a blockchain. There's no magic. So, let's take this, let's take this blockchain, let's break it down a little bit. What are these functions? So, I'm going to propose that there's three major functions of a blockchain. Data availability, execution, and consensus. Let's dig into each of these. So, well, hold on. Before we dig into them, these are three major functions of a, of a database. I'm sorry, three major functions of a blockchain. There's many other requirements. These are just a handful of them that required. Re, uh, it requires years of research, an active community, decentralized base, hundreds of users to try to build up an ecosystem that will support a blockchain database because if it's not distributed, it's not decentralized, then it's somebody's database. Uh, so digging into the first one, data availability. So data availability is the process of just having the data available for all of these users. So what makes up the data? We have addresses, we have token balances, we have NFTs, we have smart contracts, we have arbitrary data, whatever you want to put on there. Again, it's just a database. So data availability relates to the fact that you as, uh, you as an individual can run this database, run this software, and you get a copy of all of this data. If the data is withheld with you, if the blocks are withheld with you, if the user transactions are withheld with you, you can't recreate this database. So there's security aspects of it. The data availability, data availability is required to have this decentralized open database. 
Quick examples of a couple of them. Again, Alice could send coins. That's a user transaction. That needs to be available for everyone to see. If nobody can see it, then did it really happen? Uh, invoking smart contracts, using some dApps, uh, and then rendering some hot NFTs, maybe, maybe. Uh, so let's go into the next one, execution. So you may be thinking, execution, math is math, processors are processors, aren't all chains the same? Well, in, in execution side, what, what we're dealing with is scripts, programs, virtual machines, math is, is not all equal. So what we have here is we have many different execution flavors of blockchains. We have some that are more limited, that are script-based, that have uh, limitations of what you can and can't do. You have more Turing complete languages that are powerful and can do almost anything. Uh, in the EVM world, the Ethereum virtual machine world, we have Solidity and Viper are two of the most common. Solidity is very JavaScript-esque. Viper is very Python-esque. Both of these can run across many different chains. The EVM is very widespread. There's a lot of other similar things, uh, other Turing complete languages, and all this new ZK stuff that I'm not really gonna touch on, but it's called moon math, and that's, it's, it's, it's moon math for a reason. Uh, so, how many, in, how many people in here have ever tried to parse HTML with regex? And if you don't raise your hand, you're lying. And so that kind of gives you an idea here of like, if it's a limited stack-based versus a Turing complete language, what sort of computational power you can do there. You can't do certain loops, can't do certain recursion and, and whatnot. Now, I did talk about being Turing complete, but I have to, I guess, backstep that a little bit. Block space is limited. Block space is a very reserved resource. They're very relatively small compared to your normal databases that you're gonna deal with. So all the math, all the addition, subtraction, multiplication, operations, the individual operations, you can't do so many of those. If you wanna do, say, some SHA hashing, there's a lot of math on that, a lot of operations. So what a lot of chains have done, have started to add precompiles, which are just single, single opcodes to do a complex operation. The EVM, the EVMs, I know Ethereum has nine, uh, pre-compiles. Some of the other EVM chains have other codes. So all these chains, the reason why I guess execution is a major part of this is because when you deploy to a chain, you have to understand, will your code run the same there? A lot of them are supersets or subsets of one another. And so just making sure that it, it's going to execute correctly. So brings us to consensus. Consensus is defined as general agreement. And so consensus is the mechanism that allows all of these hundreds and thousands of computers to stay in sync. It brings general truth. It brings what is agreed upon truth. Blockchains are kind of self-reflective in the sense that they define truth as what they think truth is. Consensus allows them to agree on that data, what that truth is. The two major mechanisms for producing blocks and bringing everyone to the same, uh, moving, the, moving the chain along are proof of work and proof of stake. In general, proof of work is going to be electricity based and mining, lots of, uh, lots of computers turned on, lots of electricity being used. Proof of stake is gonna be capital based, so it'll be people staking coins, staking tokens for a opportunity to propose a block and get rewarded for that at the same time, they could get uh, slashed or taken, some of their capital taken away if they're not acting truthfully, or I guess uh, honestly, that's a better word for it. So we'll dig into this a little bit more, um, but consensus is a little bit of that magic sauce that allows all of these computers to agree, and again, going back to the database, allowing the database to be consistent across all these machines. So here's a quick example. This is a user A sending a coin to user B. Does this work? Ooh. So uh, user A is gonna bundle up a transaction, distribute it to the network. The network is going to look at it. Everyone's gonna agree on it. They're gonna add it to a block and the transaction is complete. So if we try to, la if we try to label these major functions, this is the data. So this is the user creating the data for, um, for their transaction they want to send the coins. The system 
network is going to execute on that data. Uh, when it's going to execute that script, that program, that smart contract. It, if it's valid and it works, then it will be added to the block. The consensus mechanism will run, sync everybody up together. Everybody's happy. You've just made a transaction. So again, sending coins, executing in, uh, smart contracts, minting NFTs. This is the same loop over and over. So let's talk about these three functions and what kind of relative cost or expense they have. And of course, depending on, uh, I guess, we're gonna try to deal with real world expense. So in a real world expense ratio, uh, the data and execution cost is almost nothing. Most chains can deal with uh, running on a Raspberry Pi. You could spend 100 bucks, maybe 200 bucks, get the major chains, get the Bitcoins, get the Ethereums, get the Litecoins on your local uh, home network. You're not going to be contributing to consensus though. You will not be mining blocks. You will not be contributing to that. That is a very expensive uh, operation. So those are the operations that cost real world money. And so with the electricity being burned, that is expensive. With the capital, with ca uh, proof of stake, you don't have lots of ex uh, electricity, but you have lots of capital being used. So you may have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, staked in order to secure this network. The consensus mechanism is a incentive for the users to act correctly. Again, it's a, they could be slashed or otherwise taken money away if they don't act honestly. So we're looking at this and we're going, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a big ratio difference. Why, why, why are we spending so much money on this consensus? Well, it's needed because other people will potentially attack you if you don't spend that money or spend that, those resources. So in order to scale this, in order to continue to take blockchains and, and build them, building that consensus layer is very difficult. You want a distributed, widespread, lots of different people contributing to this, uh, to this consensus mechanism. A hundred people running a hundred machines is going to be a lot more secure than 10 people running a thousand machines or 10,000 machines. Having a hundred people requires you to have a lot more, uh, a lot more people work together to uh, potentially attack the network than it would be to have only 10 people collaborate and potentially ta attack the network. So what if we could reuse this consensus layer in order to have more throughput, in order to have more data? Well, let's do that. So let's take our chain on the right here. This is gonna, we're gonna see this is our L1. This is our Ethereum. This is our other major m main nets. And these are going to be permissionless, be, you, you can do anything you want on it, it's permissionless. And so anybody could take and build their own data execution on top of that, reusing the same shared consensus. So the same proof of work or the same proof of stake, you don't have to build that. You can inherit that, do, uh, putting together multiple chains. So this just basically doubled our throughput of our chain. But it's permissionless, right? So why not add more? This kind of leads us to say that having a really good shared consensus, a really good base shared consensus allows us to scale this in a really good way. Now, granted, there's a lot of caveats there, but, uh, but this is the general gist. So what this is really saying is that scaling via sharing this consensus layer between L2s is, is the future. Right now, the best technology, well, the best active mainnet technology for that is called roll-ups. So you're gonna have these layer two technologies having different execution layers, getting data, and they're gonna take all that data and post it to L1. Now, you may think, well, if you're posting it there, isn't that just reusing L1? It is cheaper to post data than it is to execute data. So they're posting all this data, so you have data availability. Now you can see what those L2s are doing with the transactions that are on the L1. There's at least five different mainnets doing these kind of rollups today. We have at least five different base L1s building on them. Uh, the L2s, some of the L2s are here. Um, I will say they are much cheaper. On, on, on Ethereum, you may 
take $10, $5 to do a transaction. Uh, on these L2s, it may be 10 cents, 50 cents, a dollar. So it's a order of magnitude less expensive. When you start doing contracts and NFTs, you're talking hundreds of dollars. But on, on the layer twos, you're talking $10. And you're going to inherit that same level of security from layer one. Now, ooh, good, it barely made it. Uh, the, there's additional things if, you know, I do another talk, maybe I can talk more about the data on-chain, data off-chain thing. So with the data, there are opportunities using something called validiums or volitions that, allow, that take that data off-chain. Now that does reduce your level of security, but it, increased, it could increase your throughput and it makes it much cheaper. So you guys as developers, now you have to start thinking, we have different, we have different profiles. We can mix and match this data security and uh, data security and uh, execution different ways. Let's say you build a game. You want this game to have high throughput and you don't necessarily care about security quite as much. It's, it's, you need the high security, I'm sorry, you need the high throughput, low cost in order to make your game successful. You could do something with data off chain and actually execute on that and it, will, and it could run. If you have something that's a uh, financial application, you probably want higher security, so you want data on chain. So you want to get onto a layer two that has data on chain. So we're, co we're coming up to the end of the talk. What do I want you to take out of this? What I want you to take out of this is that blockchains are not magical. Blockchains are just scripts and databases. They're executing the data that you provide as users they're executing smart contracts and NFTs. They are giving, it, it, it's, it's just a database. I guess that's, that's, that should have been that title, it's just a database. But uh, knowing these three functions, it allows you to say, where is the data stored? Is it on chain? Is it off chain? Is it somewhere else? Is it easily accessible? Is it, uh, are the nodes open to have arbitrary people connect to them? Can you kick off your own? Uh, can you kick off your own client, your own full node on your local machine? Where is the execution capabilities? Is it limited? If you are doing uh, elliptical curve math, can that chain support it? Crazy hashing or the SHA, SHA and stuff that's even beyond that. Uh, can the cha chain support that without huge arbitrary amounts of uh, of script being written? And then consensus is really the magic sauce. So how many, how many nodes contribute to consensus? Is it 10? Is it 21? Is it 150,000? Those probably different scales there. Uh, how hard is it for those nodes to uh, coll uh, collude and potentially take over the chain? Those are things that, again, if it's, an, if it's a game or something with low security, probably doesn't matter but if it's gonna be the next billion dollar uh, finance app, maybe it matters. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, I have absolutely no idea where I am on time. So I, okay. Um, I guess I'll take questions if we have time. <laughs> I don't see too many people asleep, so thank you. Uh, yes. So the question is, what kind of data sh could be stored off chain and still be appropriate? Well, again, so NFT data, so there are on-chain generative art NFTs, like there are, but, but data on-chain is expensive. I guess that's the end of the day, because if you think about a thousand nodes having a copy of this database, you just add a data, you make a you know, one kilobyte file, you just added a one kilobyte file to every computer for all time, question mark. But so you, you, it, the network, it impacts network, it impacts the throughput. All of a sudden your Raspberry Pis, if everyone does that, the Raspberry Pis can't start doing that. So we start having fewer full nodes running in the world. So 
by having smaller nodes, it allows for more dis, uh, decentralization, more, more users doing that. So going back to your question, what's appropriate to store on, stain, on chain? Well, honestly, anything you pay for, it's permissionless. It's gonna cost a lot of money though. And so if you can store it off chain and it's, it's safe, I mean, it, it really goes down to your security model. Again, games and individual like coffee transactions, maybe not on chain for all of eternity, that's a great L2. That's a great uh, roll-up kind of idea. I'll go here and I'll go there. So the question is, what type of database is it, relational or NoSQL? So that's a great question. So there's two major types of databases. There's the, uh, and I guess I'll try to go back real quick, maybe. No, I'm not going to. Uh, so there's two major, so you have your Litecoins, your Bitcoins, those are called UTXOs, so unspent transactions. And so those are going to be key value pairs between accounts and their unspent transactions. So those can be easily done in like a, like a, like a Mongo or a Rocks DB, just key value pairs. The account models are gonna be a little, bit, a little bit more complex. Those are more like a bank account, so they're, gonna, they're going to have a ledger, like a, this account has all of these properties on it. And so those can be easily be stored in a key value pair as well. So I guess long answer short, key value pair should work for you. Uh, relational, you have to build these, you have to go through all the blocks to, to figure out the transaction history, to figure out what the current state is. As the blocks add on, the chain, the chain state changes. So, I also so no. So you can you can create any sort. So built into each protocol, the API, you could build it on any kind of database you want. So it's all about the blocks or the data, and then depending on how you, I mean, each client does it differently. But there's going to be multiple clients for a lot of different chains. Does that help? So, so the, 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 the question is, can you compare the execution client to some regular com computer program thing that you can understand? Right, so um, the example with trying to parse HTML with a regex. So it's, it's all about uh, the computer theory of aut aut automata. Like there's different levels of computing. So Turing complete can compute anything that's computable. There's uh, push down stack based, there's uh, finite state. So any sort of finite machine has a certain number of states that it can travel to. So regex is going to be my best example for regex you can't do anything. Like there's limited stuff you can do because of the way the language is. Um, Would I compare the execution to SQL? Um, so this is the virtual, at a high level. So really the execution is, is the underlying CPU of the machine. So it's like X64 or the ARM or what the instruction sets are that it can do. Okay, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question is, the execution part, is that, <coughs> is that multiple users contributing to the execution part? So no, every node executes independently. And that's why you as a, a user, as a blockchain like skeptic, could run your own node. And if you trusted the code that you had, you could verify the chain locally. Now granted, I guess, when we start getting to L2s, there's a little bit of a little bit of off-chain execution and trust, a little bit of trust there. But in over time, as the L2s become more mature, you should be able to get that data that was posted on chain and execute it yourself and trust that data. So that's where we are today. We're not quite there where all the L2 data, you 
you can't run a sequencer and uh, reproduce that for all of them today. We're, we're working through that. And I say we, I'm not doing it. Somebody else is. <laughs> I don't know how we're doing on time. All right, well, I guess I'll end it here. Thank you for coming, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be around. Feel free to stop me and ask questions or tell me how horrible this is. But, uh...